From Bloomberg World Headquarters in New York to our TV and radio audiences worldwide, I'm David Weston, and welcome to Balance of Power, where the world of politics meets the world of business. We begin today in Washington, where lawmakers are trying to sort out President Trump's four, count them, four executive orders from Saturday, and what they may mean from the negotiations up on Capitol Hill about a possible fourth stimulus bill. To really explain this all to you, we welcome our Washington bureau chief. He is Craig Gordon. So, Craig, you got to explain it to us. What does this do to the dynamic down there right now? Does this shift the burden sort of back to the Democrats? You know, it's a tricky one because if you're Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer, the two leading Democratic negotiators, you do not want to look like you're standing between people and their unemployment checks. That said, what Trump tried to do is obviously kind of a Band-Aid fix. Um, the, the amount of money is $300 from the federal government. But the key thing that I think hasn't even been really reported enough yet is the only states that can get this money are states where the governor agrees to kick in $100 of their own money to make it $400 a week, sort of a matching, a matching grant. You could imagine that this, the governor's already financially strapped. And these are Republican and Democratic governors, both pretty financially strapped by the COVID crisis, are not that eager to have to have to take over, you know, basically funding the federal government is supposed to be providing. So Trump hasn't had a lot of takers on this offer. And right now, these checks are not going anywhere until some governors step forward and say they'll kick in their their share. It does feel a bit like a game of chess, though, because we heard the Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin earlier today saying, oh, wait a second, we've already given you the money you need to spend, states. There's a bunch of money you haven't spent from the CARES Act. It's just sitting there. Just use that money. Yeah, I don't think the states really see it that way, <laughs> actually. It's funny how the, the Treasury Secretary does see it that way. Look, th there's also this, you know, this little bit of a game of tit for tat where, you know, Trump basically looks at all the states you know, previously the most hardest hit states were the Democratic states. You had Illinois, you had New York, California, still pretty bad on the list. Now you're getting some Republican states, um, Florida, Arizona, places like that. So, you know, the, the, the Trump team has been, has been very critical of the state's handling of their finances. And look, some of these states' um, budget balance sheets are, are awash in red. Illinois, known for its sort of pension problems, New York State, perennially running a, f a budget deficit. So Trump doesn't want to, air quotes, bail out states. I think right now, if I were Donald Trump, I might be thinking a little bit more about the people and a little bit less about the politicians. The people have been you know, relying on the $600 a week extra in unemployment insurance up till now. It expired on J July 31st. They are getting $0. And I'm not sure I'd want to be the president of the United States when a bunch of people who are getting those checks to keep their families you know, fed and supported or suddenly see that evaporate. They're looking to the White House for leadership. Trump's trying to, you know, kind of punt back to the states. I think Trump's going to take the blame for this one. Well, that's interesting, Craig, because whether it's $300 or $400, $300 being the federal part, $100 being the state part, at least it's some money. Do we have any sense of how fast they could get to the people? Because if it gets there pretty fast, can't President Trump say, look, at Congress, Republicans and Democrats couldn't get it done. I saved you. Yeah, and this, and this is, as you said, this is the game of chess. Or more, it's almost more of a game of chicken. The two cars are speeding toward each other. Who's going to veer off first? Right now, the Democrats are holding their ground. They are saying what Trump did is essentially constitutionally, you know, illegal. Um, it's Congress that allocates the money, you know, for the federal budget, not the president. As you say, I, I think a, a family, you know, trying to put some food on his table during this very tricky time isn't really thinking about constitutional law. But I think Democrats still feel like they have the upper upper hand as of today. And, and I think that what you can read into that is there are no negotiations scheduled at this point. I'm, you know, people that have been following this, and Mnuchin and uh, Mark Meadows, the White House chief of staff, were, you know, kind of wearing a path up to Capitol Hill. Over the past few weeks, there there are no talks scheduled right now. Everyone is kind of you know retreated to their neutral corners, waiting for the other person to make the first move. And right now, no one's making that move. Yeah, it's fascinating. It is a complicated game of chicken. Probably you're right, better than chess. Thank you so much to Craig Gordon. He is our Bloomberg Washington bureau chief. Well, one part, uh, one of those executive orders, actually, I should say, really suspended payroll tax payments until the end of the year, something Mr. Trump had wanted to get in the stimulus bill rather than his executive order. Welcome now, Maddie Dupler. She is founder and president of Forward Strategies and a senior fellow for fiscal policy at the National Taxpayers Union. Maddie, always great to have you on, particularly when it comes to taxes. Explain to us how how this works exactly this payroll tax because it isn't clear exactly what employers will do well you know what david you nailed it it's not clear what employers will do and therein lies the problem so the administration really only has authority to uh, work with deadlines when it comes to taxes they don't have the authority to repeal taxes or prevent people from paying taxes that's what happened uh, this year with the tax filing deadline for income taxes treasury used its authority to push that deadline back because we're in the middle of an emergency so when it comes to the payroll tax the question here is who is the taxpayer and what are they liable for if you're someone who's ever got 
gotten a paycheck, you know that those FICA taxes come out of your paycheck before you ever even see them. Your employer is responsible for making that change in your taxable income. So the question here for employers then is what do they do with this payroll money that the president wants to go directly to workers? Because the president can't forgive those taxes, employers right now are looking at being liable for them at the end of the year when this executive order expires. That creates a real problem for businesses, particularly right now, as they struggle with uncertainty in these very, very uncertain economic times. So, Maddie, as you say, there's a statute, as I understand, that requires the FICA taxes to be taken out. Does the president clearly have authority at least to delay the collection of them? The delay is not the question. The question is the impact on the people that the president really wants to impact. Of course, voters, right? He said this is going to go to workers making less than $100,000 a year, but the employers are the ones who are responsible for making that change. So if employers are going to do that, if they're going to stop withholding those Social Security taxes for uh, workers, that means those employers need to make up that cash somewhere if, come next year, the administration says, well, you know, we deferred those taxes, but now that deadline is back on schedule. The business employers and the businesses and the employers in that scenario are going to be liable for those taxes. So if you're a business who already is facing an uncertain next couple of weeks, months, and maybe even years, what you're going to do is probably sit on that cash. You're not going to redispense it to your workers. You're going to hold on to it until you know that you're not going to be liable for that tax liability at the end of the year when this executive order expires. Uh, Manny, in a prior life, you worked up there on Capitol Hill. Give us some sense. President Trump <laughs> has made no secret of the fact he wants to really cut payroll taxes. Does this put more pressure right. on Congress down the road to actually cut the taxes, not just defer them, but to, but cut, to cut them? Well, you know, there are a couple of idioms when it comes to uh, tax legislating, and one of them is that inertia does work. Uh, so when you're looking at the next couple of months, if this deferral is to go into effect uh, and say there's a change in power, a change in administration after the election, then it's the onus on the uh, next administration to say what they're going to do with that tax liability. No politician wants to be the politician raising taxes in the middle of a recession, particularly when they are taxes on workers. The challenge with the payroll tax is workers, when it's taken out of their paycheck, don't necessarily notice when it's put back in. That's why you saw in 2008 President Bush uh, opting for stimulus checks, President Trump, of course, doing the same earlier this spring. Uh, when people are written a check from the government, they tend to see that as money, free money in their pocket, rather than getting a little bit of a bump up when their payroll taxes are diminished. So that's going to be a question of politics as we head into the next next year. Certainly, I think the inertia will be on the side of taxpayers when it comes to reconciling that deferral. Uh, but there's certainly no guarantee that those employers won't be on the hook for those payroll taxes when this executive order expires. So that's employers, that's employees, that's President Trump. We should talk about why you have those taxes withheld in the first place. They go for Social Security and for Medicare and things like that. Normally, that's sort that's of right. a third rail. You don't want to be cutting that. How can you cut the taxes without cutting back in the benefits? That, that's exactly right. So uh, the benefits, obviously, um, are under the onus of the Treasury Department. The Treasury Department is essentially the trustee of the Social Security Trust Fund. So Treasury has already said that benefits will be made whole. Uh, the Social Security actuaries have already told us that even with this downturn in employment because of coronavirus, it really only creates a little bit of a dent in the uh, trust fund solvency, you know, moves the solvency date up six, uh, six months or so, but we're still looking at years and years of solvency. So benefits themselves at this moment aren't imperiled. But when it comes to the political argument about this executive order, certainly the president has opened him up, himself up to criticism when you're looking at Social Security taxes. In 2011, when the Social Security tax was cut uh, to help with the recessionary forces there, an act of Congress was used to do that, and the general fund was used to replace uh, some of the revenues that were lost as a result of that tax cut. So, Maddie, as an expert in this area, do you think that a lot of people, it's basically people who make $100,000 or less, Less, as I understand it, who have their payroll taxes deferred. Do you think they'll see more money or not? They certainly, well, it, again, with all the questions with taxes, David, it certainly depends. If employers can figure out a way to withhold this, these taxes from employees' paychecks, those employees would see more money on their paychecks. I think the bigger question heading into election is whether or not they notice. As we saw with the adjudication of the 2017 tax law, people who saw 20 extra bucks a month in their paycheck mm. didn't really seem to notice, even though over the course of the year, that adds up to thousands of dollars. Uh, so when it comes to how... Res uh, 
how sensitive, I should say, taxpayers are to their paychecks right. and their manipulation because of taxes. That's always an outstanding question. And I think that when it comes to this executive order, the application, particularly because employers are in charge here, is going to be a little bit tricky. Fascinating. Thank you so much. Always great to have you with us. That's Maddie Duffler. She is the founder and president of Forward Strategies and senior fellow for fiscal policy at the National Taxpayers Union. Coming up here, we go through the politics of the executive orders with Bloomberg political contributor Jeannie Zeno. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. We turn now to Mark Crumpton for Bloomberg First Word News. David, thank you. COVID-19 doesn't seem to follow the seasonal patterns that some other viruses do. That's according to the World Health Organization. The agency's health emergencies chief says unlike other respiratory viruses like the flu that spread mainly in the winter, the coronavirus pandemic is picking up steam in the summer. This virus has demonstrated no seasonal pattern as such so far. What it has clearly demonstrated is you take the pressure off the virus, the virus bounces back. That's the reality, that's the fact. You can call that a second wave, you can call that a second spike, you can call that a flare-up, you can call it anything you like. Take the pressure off this virus, the virus will bounce back. And the WHO is urging countries, even where COVID-19 appears to be under control, such as those in Europe, to maintain measures to slow the spread of the virus. In Lebanon, the government has resigned over that massive explosion that blast last week in Beirut, killed more than 150 people and injured thousands. It also led to violent protests. The explosion was caused by several thousand tons of volatile material left at the country's main port despite repeated safety warnings. Violence on the streets of Chicago overnight. Hundreds of people smashed windows, looted stores, and battled police in the city's magnificent Miles shopping district. There was an exchange of gunfire at one point. It's not clear what caused the violence, but anti-police graffiti was seen in the area. More than 100 people were arrested and 13 officers were said to have been injured. And in Portland, Oregon, violent protests continued for another night. Demonstrators used a mortar to launch commercial-grade fireworks at police, injuring two officers. Protesters also managed to get inside the police union building and set a fire. The protests in Portland have happened nightly for 70 days since George Floyd was killed in Minneapolis. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Quick Take by Bloomberg, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. David? Thanks so much, Mark. President Trump really reshuffled the political deck in Washington on Saturday by, with those four executive orders, which essentially went around Congress. To take us through the politics of all this maneuvering, we welcome now Bloomberg political contributor Jeannie Zeno, professor of political science at Iona College. Jeannie, great to have you with us. So last time we talked was actually Friday night. The president said he was going to maybe do his executive orders. He did it. What does it do to the calculus right now up on Capitol Hill? Well, yeah, I mean, it was a very bizarre weekend because, of course, we were told the president would not be making many public statements. And then he came out Friday and then again Saturday signing these four executive orders. And, you know, he really hit on four key areas. And in part, this happened because, of course, we saw the Democrats and the representatives from the White House unable to come to an agreement or even get close on Friday, seem to throw up their hands. And so the president came out and said he was going to take these actions. But of course, the actions he took raised substantial legal questions, constitutional questions. And then there's a substantive aspect, which is, is it really going to help the people that need to be helped? And so there's all kinds of messiness regarding his actions. And of course, as you were just talking about, no plans for Congress and the White House to meet to strike the kind of deal that the American public actually needs. Well, you mentioned uh, legal challenges, constitutional challenges, and we'll get into that in the second hour, balance of power. But as a practical matter, it's going to take an awful lot of courage for any Democrat to sue to keep the money away from the people, isn't it? I mean, who's going to bring that lawsuit? 
Yeah, and we heard Nancy Pelosi, Chuck Schumer out on the Sunday shows, you know, unable to answer, unwilling probably to answer the question as to whether they would take legal action. The president and his team all but dared them to take legal action and put Democrats in the position of stopping aid. But the reality is we're probably going to see legal challenges from somewhere because this does raise questions. And of course, the fact is what the president has proposed to do, even if there are no legal challenges, which is unlikely, it's hard to imagine it works at all or it works in the way he would like it to. We've already heard governors like Governor Cuomo from New York come out and say the states simply don't have the funding that's needed to help supplement. So the president, as you talked about, is saying that the feds will cover 75 percent of this, states cover $100 or 25 percent. And it's unclear at this point if the governors, even Republican governors, Governors are going to agree to do that. And of course, you can't get into the system unless your governor agrees to that. Then you have to set up a program to get this money to the people. So at the very best case scenario, this would be a long time coming for the people on the ground to be able to get this kind of aid. So net net in the end, in your assessment, does this make a deal up on Capitol Hill more likely or less likely? Who feels more pressure given what the president's done with those executive orders? You know, I think it makes a deal less likely at this point, you know, and that's the real frustration here is I wish the president would have spent more of his time. And, and again, he does not own all of this. Of course, Democrats, they couldn't come to a deal either, but more time trying to bring his own Republican caucus together, because that's really where we're at an impasse is you've got many Republicans who are saying they don't want to do this kind of spending. And obviously, Democrats own their part of this unwilling to come down enough. So if the president could get his own caucus to a point where you would get Mitch McConnell, who's been all but absent from these negotiations, to the table, then you may have a better chance. But at this point, none of that seems to be in the offing, or at least in the near term. I can't imagine either Congress or the president want to go to the election not having a deal like this because people are really suffering out there. Well, exactly. I mean, this is most important for those men and women who are out of work and don't have money to pay their bills. But there are political consequences, you suggest, for the November 3 election. Uh, we now have some polls out from CBS just within the last 24 hours or so indicating that particularly in Wisconsin and Pennsylvania, President Trump is lagging behind Joe Biden. It's sort of consistent with other polls we've seen. Yeah, absolutely. He Biden is up six points in these two states that the president won in 2016. And really, he must win um, Pennsylvania and Wisconsin. Um, and of course, in, in your home state of Michigan, he is down by 11. And it looks like the Republicans are all going to but cede that state to the Democrats at this point. So the map in terms of the battleground for the president is really shrinking. And when we look behind the numbers, what we're seeing is that a lot of that has to do with COVID. The president still gets fairly good marks from voters on the economy as it was before the pandemic, but they are not confident, at least these sort of swing independent voters that he needs in those states, that he is in the best position to manage this in terms of the pandemic. And you, you're seeing people feel more comfortable with Joe Biden in that. And that's where the president seems to be losing some of his support in those states. Although there are wrinkles here. For instance, you look at a state like Pennsylvania, New Hampshire, where we don't have things like perhaps college students returning in as large numbers as we might have to register to vote. And the president's team feels like they may be able to pull out a state like New Hampshire for those types of reasons. So they're still battling on. This thing is still too early to call. But they are have got to be very frustrated by Biden's lead in those states and the fact that the president doesn't seem to be able to show those independent swing voters that he can manage this pandemic. And just to tie it all up with a bow, that same poll, if it is right, suggested that people now are more concerned about how coronavirus is being handled than about the economy. Normally, it's pocketbook issues. Uh, actually, people were saying, no, no, we're mainly concerned about the pandemic. Yeah, absolutely. And of course, it's directly tied into the economy, to education and to all these other things. And that's what we're seeing. And, you know, when you and I talked three, four months ago before the pandemic, six months ago now, you know, the economy was always and usually is number one. But as that drops back, that is a problem for the president and his team. And they're really hoping that this VP selection by Biden sort of turns the page and they can talk about Biden and not the president's handling of the pandemic, which he doesn't do well in. And I want you to stick around, if you would, for the second hour 
balance of power on radio because we're going to talk about exactly that. Vice President Biden's VP selection coming up. That's Jeannie Zeno, our political contributor here at Bloomberg. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. It's time now to check in on the markets. The Nasdaq is deciding it's a good day to take some money off the table, maybe, as China is going back after the United States after its sanctions. In the meantime, Washington can't get its act together on stimulus. Here to take us all through it is Scarlett Fu. Scarlett. Yeah, David, that's right. We're seeing a bit of an unwind of recent market trends now that the bulk of earnings season is over and we've got a political stalemate to wait out. So what you're seeing today is uh, small caps, which is a proxy for value outperforming and also industrials as represented by the Dow Jones Industrial Average doing better than the S&P and Nasdaq. Of course, this barely makes a dent in what we've seen so far this year. The Nasdaq 100 up more than 25 percent regularly closing at record highs, leaving everything else behind in its wake. And that outperformance reflects the earnings picture. We're about 90 percent of the way through second quarter results. And on average, S&P 500 companies posted 11 percent declines in sales growth, 9 percent declines in earnings growth. Only two sectors reporting both top line and bottom line growth, health care and technology. Tells you the state of the world, David. Yeah, exactly. What about the state of Washington? We did have those four executive orders out of President Trump. In the meantime, there's an impasse up on Capitol Hill. Are the markets reacting to that at all today, do you think? Well, I mean, people expect Washington to come up with something at the 11th hour. That's usually how it goes, and they've been conditioned to think that that will come together at the end. However, having said that, Goldman Sachs estimates that the president's executive orders really just buy some time. It pushes out the new deadline to early September. And, of course, a lot of analysts' notes make the point that a market tantrum is needed before Congress and Washington really gets its act together. Matt Maley of Miller Tabak quantifies it as a 7 to 10 percent pullback in equities for Washington really to pay attention. Of course, when it comes to our usual savior, the Fed, it really is standing back and saying, come on, Congress, Washington, you have to get your act together, step up and support the economy. Charlie Evans was the latest uh, Fed official to do just that. And then you also have Neil Kashkari, the Minneapolis Fed president, who takes it one step further. With the start of flu season coming around the corner, he co-authored an opinion piece that suggested the U.S. consider another hard lockdown on a state-by-state -state basis of four to six weeks. I don't know how many people will take him up on that, but it is an idea. In terms of positioning, with indexes near record highs, domestic fund flows have now fallen for a seventh straight week, really showing that investors are kind of reluctant to continue uh, chasing the gains and putting new money to work. Also, gold continues to push higher, especially with negative real rates. So that's another trend we're keeping an eye on. David. A lot of trends in there, but we all have to keep one eye on that coronavirus without a doubt. Thank you so much to Scarlett Fu. Up next, we're going to talk about the state of the U.S. economy following Friday's jobs numbers and President Trump's four executive orders. We're going to talk about that with Sean Golhar. He is Barclays head of public policy research. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Bell and Radio. I'm David Weston. It's time now for First Word News. And for that, we go to Mark Crumpton. David, thank you. Weather is being ruled out as a factor in Friday's deadly crash of an Indian passenger plane. The Air India Express jet skidded off the runway and careened down a slope, breaking into three pieces. Bloomberg has learned that visibility conditions were within safe ranges and pilots were briefed about them before the crash. That crash killed at least 18 people and hurt more than 100 others. Iran shut down a newspaper today after it published an interview with a doctor who accused the country of lying about how bad the coronavirus outbreak is there. The paper quoted an epidemiologist who said the true number of cases and deaths in Iran could be 20 times higher than the official number being reported. He also said the virus was detected in Iran a month earlier than February 19th, when the first confirmed case was announced there. Nearly a week after Tropical Storm Isaias ripped through the New York area, at least 160,000 homes and businesses are still without power. 
Some of the outages are on Long Island in the Hudson Valley and in western Connecticut. New York and Connecticut have both launched investigations into utility efforts to restore power. Consolidated Edison says it expects to be able to restore service to most customers by tonight. Senate Homeland Security Chairman Ron Johnson says he subpoenaed the FBI for documents related to the Trump-Russia investigation. The, Russia, the Wisconsin Republican Center Senator is also defending a separate investigation he's leading into Joe Biden and Ukraine. U.S. intelligence indicates Russia is working to denigrate Biden ahead of the November presidential election. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Quick Take by Bloomberg, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. David? Thanks very much, Mark. Friday, we got a read on the U.S. economy with those jobs numbers. But things are changing so fast these days that some people wonder whether those numbers were out of date even before we got them. In order to give us a real read on the economy right now, we welcome now Sean Golhar. He is Barclays' head of public policy research. Sean, great to have you here. A lot happened even over the weekend with those executive orders, but putting those to one side for the moment, uh, where do you feel the economy is and in its heading right now? Well, yeah, thank you for having me. Uh, absolutely. We did see some positive gains in the economy of 1.8 million jobs. Um, and we do see the unemployment rate ticking down to about eight and a half percent by the end of the year. Um, but we do have some mixed signals in this. You know, we do think, you know, calendar year GDP growth, we think uh, for 2020 will actually go down by a little over five percent um, to rebound in 2021. If they fail to get any congressional legislation done on a stimulus package, you know, you could see this trim two to three percentage points off the baseline GDP by the end of the year as well. But one thing that's of note is the difference of opinion and how they view the economy from political side. The Republicans and Democrats have a very different view of how things are going, um, and that translates over to whether or not you know the, the virus is behind us. 61 percent of Republicans in a recent Pew poll think that the worst is actually behind us, while only 23 percent of Democrats do. And that translates over to do we even need more economic aid? 51 percent of Republicans think so versus a whopping 87 percent of Democrats. So, so before we go into the politics of it, Sean, uh, give us some read on some data other than just like the monthly jobs numbers. I mean, in your note, you refer to the difference between the PMI and the ISM, the market indications. They really point to different things. And also some of the higher frequency things like the jobless numbers are giving people some pause, right, because they really are coming down. You know, absolutely. And, and our economists have this really terrific, at Barclays, this really terrific uh, high-frequency index that they've been looking at to help get a real read on it because things have been changing so quickly. Um, and we do see a lot of mixed signals on this. Um, we, by no stretch of the imagination, are not uh, uh, on board with the idea that this is a very robust recovery going forward. We do think some of these shoots and job gains are substantial um, and do paint the way. But a lot of these uh, assumptions that we're making into this, we also are putting into there that Congress does come forward with a stimulus package. I mean, our previous baseline for the last couple months has been, you know, somewhere in the orders of a trillion dollar stimulus package with a lot of aid for state and local governments, continuing unemployment insurance. Obviously, those negotiations have hit have hit a few obstacles, and we don't see those moving forward right now. Well, no question some obstacles, but President Trump did his best to sort of, I guess, overcome or go around those obstacles on Saturday with those four executive orders. What do you make of right. those? Are they a substitute in any way, shape, or form for a real stimulus bill? Because it does address some unemployment payments, as you know, some something Supplemental payments for mm -hmm. that, uh, and, and also the payroll tax supposedly is going to get some money into people's pockets. Yeah, no, we, you know, it buys some time, I think, for both sides to come together. I mean, the policy differences between Democrats and Republicans right now really center on the unemployment insurance, on aid to state and locals. But, you know, when you begin to add those up, it's real money, and you're talking about, you know, well over a trillion dollars of differences in terms of how much is needed. Um, I thought the president's, though, executive orders, they do buy some time. Um, I do not think the economic impact would be the same as legislation, but it does give both sides the ability to, to take a break and, and think through it and help and hopefully come back to the negotiating table. As of right now, it doesn't look like they have um, you know any date on the calendar to continue the negotiations. But for all the viewers, you know, we should keep in mind there is going to be a major deadline at the end of September when we need to get another government uh, funding bill in the form of a continuing resolution. That's an, that's an opportunity where we could see this phase four stimulus package come forward again. The extent to which the president has bought some time, as you say, to get a real deal done depends in part on whether the money will actually go out the door and get to people. There are some people who question whether, for example, employers will pass along to employees uh, 
right. uh, deferral of taxes where they're going to have to pay for them again down the road. Uh, and, and also whether the states will really go along with this. They'll have to ch chuck in $100 for the $300 the federal government does. Yeah, there's a lot of questions in these executive orders. And you're right, on the unemployment insurance, a lot of governors are expressing concern about this. How are they going to be able to fund this, given all the other problems that play at, 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 uh, currently are, uh, you know, at play? The you know, payroll tax deferral, it really is just a short-term no-interest loan for qualifying individuals, but it could have an impact on Social Security solvency, and you're seeing that in terms of polling. Um, all, are any of these things, are they legal? You know, you could see some challenges for the court. Not that, you know, one party or the other or some politician wants to take money away, but there are constitutional issues at play. And even the moratorium on evictions, this is only going to be uh, applicable to buildings that have federally guaranteed mortgages. So those with private mortgages could still face eviction. So, so from an economics point of view, does the fact that I'll use the expression, there's so much hair on the deal, it's so complicated, so many uncertainties, whether it's legal challenges or whether states go along or whether employers go along, does that in and of itself have something of a dampening effect on the stimulative effect? Oh, absolutely. And, and again, I'll go back to what I said in the beginning of this, that you know this will not have the same effect on the economy as passing legislation. Um, I think what this does is, again, buys members of Congress a little bit of time. Now, if in the next few weeks we see new, uh, new data coming in that is quite dire, we see more governors speaking up, voicing concern about the unemployment uh, insurance situation, it may compel Congress to come back and, and come to a vote or an agreement, rather, in the month of August. Right now, um, you know, we have to wait to see if the data comes in and shows that. But right now, it seems to have just bought us some time politically. But certainly on the economic impact, this is not the same impact as passing legislation. So, Sean, you mentioned earlier that you were hypothesizing maybe $1 trillion, I think you said, for a stimulus bill. That's right. basically where the Republicans are. And part of the problem is the Democrats are saying, look, we came down from 3.5 to 2.5. You go up to 2, and then we'll have a nice negotiation. Is $1 trillion enough, as it were? You know, it, it, that's a great question. Probably not. Um, you know, if you want to look at the state and local government component, you know, you're talking about it probably at least $500 billion. I know Democrats asked for a trillion, but, you know, you could cobble together a, a stimulus package that is slightly under a trillion. It will still have, you know, a significant impact. It might not be enough as defined by some on the Democratic side, but they may also say to themselves, let's just wait, get this done, and wait till after the election. Um, they may be thinking in their back of their heads that politically, while they can't get this done now at a level that they're comfortable with, just get it done now to help the economy get through the fall and help us get uh, and continue fighting COVID-19 and then aim for a bigger package post the election. OK, Sean, always a pleasure to have you with us. That's Sean Golhar. He is head of public policy research over at Barclays. Coming up, the path of an erratic virus with Dr. Jay Bhattacharya of Stanford. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. We've now had 5 million cases of COVID-19 in the United States, although the number of additional cases each day seems to be leveling off now. We welcome now Dr. Jay Bhattacharya. He is professor of medicine at Stanford University. Doctor, great to have you back with us. Give us your best assessment right now of where we are, because I must say there are times I think maybe we're getting our arms around it. Other times I think maybe it's changing where it is and what it's doing uh, like from day to day. Yeah, sure. It does seem confusing to some extent because it, it's it, and I think the key to understanding it is that it's not one epidemic in the United States. Uh, it's not a national epidemic in one sense. It's a collection of re different regional epidemics and different places are different spots in the epidemic. Uh, the Northeast, for instance, seems to have had a terrible time early on and there looks like they're mostly through it. Uh, the Sun Belt has had a, a rough time of it, and then it looks like they're, they're, they're for the most part, improving, Texas, Arizona, Florida. Um, uh, California lo looks like it's, it's the Southern California especially, looks like it's peaking. Um, there are places like Hawaii that locked down very effectively, had almost no cases, and now we're starting to see a rise in cases again. It, the pattern of the epidemic seems to follow a very similar course in the regions where you are, where, where they are. So uh, places that lock down, you don't, you don't get rid of the, the, the epidemic. You just delay the onset of it. Uh, and places that don't lock down, you're going you're, you're gonna to get a, a, a huge increase in cases. Um, that just is because of the nature of the infectious disease. 
To me, the key thing is how well are we protecting the most vulnerable? Um, so for instance, if, if, uh, if, if we have the epidemic spreading among older populations that we know die from the disease, have severe, severe damage from the disease, um, I think that's a failure. Uh, whereas if we if we if we uh, are able to protect those vulnerable populations um, in different regions, you know we, we're gonna we're, I'd, I'd say that that that's probably the best we can do given that there's no vaccine as yet. Well, those of us uh, who, who are parents really were struck over the week with that news that in the last two weeks of July, evidently a hundred thousand children contracted the disease, up about forty percent. Explain that. That seems like a dramatic number. Yeah, I mean it's. it's I, I don't know if this is good news. I mean, I, 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 it's, it's mixed news. I actually think it's more than that uh, because, as, as you know, the, the, the number of identified cases is not the same as the number of, of actual cases because our testing misses a lot of people. The CDC did a, a study suggesting that somewhere between six to 24 times more people are, are have the disease, and, and that probably is true for children as well, than, than actually get identified with the disease. So it's, it's probably, the number is probably much larger than that. Um, how much, how worrisome should that be? And for, for schools, that's a really good question. I, I, I myself have two uh, two younger kids and a, and, a, and a 19 year old as well. So this is something I'm 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 thinking about. I, I think uh, first it's important to know that the risk to kids themselves is much 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 lower than it is to older people, especially elderly people. Uh, I think in California, for instance, not a single person kid under uh, under 18 has died during the epidemic. Um, I mean, obviously, it's still a serious disease. More people, more kids have died from from uh, suicide, from flu, from other 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 kinds of things than the than, than COVID. So, in, so in one sense, uh, to kids themselves, the epidemic does not pose a, a, a huge threat. The, the the disease does not pose a huge threat. The key question is, what role do kids play in spreading the disease around around the uh, you know around? Um, there, the, the, the information is really interesting. So there's studies like, uh, uh, there's a study in Iceland where what they did is they, they looked at a, a, a sample of the entire population. They got the virus sample out of every single person. And what they did, and they, and they sequenced the genome of each virus. And from that, they could tell, for instance, if I had virus uh, with, with a mutation A and you had virus mutation A and B, I might have passed the virus to you, but you couldn't have passed the virus to me. Hmm. What they found was not one single case of a kid passing the disease to an adult, not one case in all of Iceland, all of this like random Iceland data. At the same time, there there's things like uh, the school, uh, schools opening in Israel and the virus spreading there, or the Georgia, the the, the recent study, uh, the right. recent recent case in Georgia, uh, the the summer camp in Georgia where kids, so kids certainly can spread the disease to one another. That is absolutely the case. It seems like they pose much less of a risk of, pose of spreading the disease to adults once they have it, though. Um, most of the research suggests that kids play a limited role in spreading the disease. I think if schools take appropriate precautions, you know, social distancing, um, masks, it's, it can be safe. I mean, of course, every, every school district has its own story, and you have to see what resources are available. But I think it's, it, it can be done safely. Uh, and, and, and countries around the world have opened schools to physical learning. And so Denmark opened up with more cases per, right. uh, per population than, than we, we have right now. And it looks like relatively safely. So I think it's possible to do it. It's just that it's a question of, of designing the policies right so that we can, we can do it safely. Doctor, what can we do better in fighting this virus? And let me focus in specifically on testing, which there's a lot of talk about testing, whether we're doing enough, whether we're not doing enough, even President Trump suggesting we're doing too much. Bill Gates over the weekend really lashed out at the job we've done. This is part of what he said. We're paying million, billions of dollars in this very inequitable way to get the most worthless test results. No other country has this testing insanity. A bit harsh, I suspect, but, but are we really uh, uh, failing at the testing? I wouldn't say we're failing. I mean, I think um, there's been a lot of emphasis on getting many, many, many of these, these PCR-based tests, which checks to see if you actively have the virus. I think the main problem is the delays in testing. You get a result, you get tested, and it can take a week to get the result back. I mean, in that week, you could have spread the virus. I mean, so I think what needs to happen is uh, a shift toward tests that may be a little less accurate, but they can be done rapidly so that we can be get better estimates of, and, and cheaply, well, that, so that we can get better, more accurate 
actionable information. We'll talk about that, Doctor, because as you know, six states have banded together now, uh, and they're, they are led by both Democrats and Republicans, and they've really, they're working with the Rockefeller Foundation, because specifically they're going to antigen tests, as I understand it, are much faster and cheaper, but are not as accurate. Is that a sensible thing to do? I think it's completely sensible. I mean, you want to be able to tell you know, okay, I'm going to go. Uh, I'm going to go to school today, and, and I, I'm a teacher. I, I want to know if I'm going to be spreading the virus. I, I want even a, a, a slightly less accurate test that I can act on right now will be better than a, te a very, very accurate test where I learn the result a week from now. In that week, I've spread the disease. You know, uh, so I think I think that's a completely. Sense. I'm not saying don't do the more accurate test. That can be part of clinical management. It can even be part of an epidemiologic strategy. But it should be only part of it, not not the whole of it. Uh, and I think uh, allowing slightly less accurate tests that have a rapid turnaround that are very cheap is a really good idea. And what about pool testing? That's something we hear about as well, that if you don't have a very high incidence, you can do a large group. And then if there's nobody in the group, they're all clear. If there's somebody, then you do individual tests. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, for an epidemiologic study purposes, those are it's a great idea. For in like for individual decisions about uh, you know how is it safe to go to uh, reopening schools is it is those kinds of those kinds of things I think um, I, it, I, it, it's not I'm not against it it's just it seems like it's has going to have a limited role on on day to day decision making and certainly for clinical decision making it's not that useful you know doctor it's interesting we talked with Dr Fauci uh, last week and. What he basically indicated, I, what I took away from what he said is, look, at, we're working on a vaccine. We may get a vaccine, may get it relatively soon, but don't count on it being 100 percent effective. And therefore, we can use a vaccine, but also we still are going to have to do social distancing and masks and things like that. Are we going to have to basically live with this almost like a chronic disease for an extended period of time? I mean, it's. I think I've thought that all along, David. I think uh, this is something we're just, we are going to have to learn, learn to live with. But you know, we're not. It's not. It's not a disaster in that sense. Like we learn to live with the flu. We learn to live with many, many infectious diseases. It's just a lot of human existence to some extent. Uh, and we'll learn to live with this. This is not worse than tuberculosis. This is not worse than uh, the malaria. This is not worse than the flu. You know, you know, in the world, you know, in, in terms of like its its scope of human history. Um, uh, it, I mean, it's wor it's worse than the flu for very elderly people, if not for not for for young people. So I mean, I think it's 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 a bad disease. It's infectious, and it and it and, and it's going to cause harm. But we have we will. Uh, but shutting down our world in order to to, to avoid this one disease. It creates so many other harms. We have no choice. We have to learn to live with it. And can we keep the economy going? To some extent, I mean, I think so. I mean, I think uh, I think uh, we're seeing. Countries around the world that are, sorry, Sweden's a good example of this. There's the economic hit they had there is less, and they seem to be on the other side of the epidemic. Um, uh, countries that have that are on the other side of the epidemic seem to be open, opening up. Um, I, I think it's possible. I, I do think that it, it's going to have economic harm. People a social distanced from uh, econ a socially distanced economy is going to be less efficient than uh, than a not socially distanced economy. So in that sense. It's going to have some economic harm. There's no way around that. By the way, we had that with terrorism as well. It was less efficient, but we learned how to deal with it, the TSA. Thanks so much to Dr. Jay Bhattacharya from Stanford University's professor of medicine there. In the meantime, we're going to turn next, coming back up, to Lebanon's government, which has resigned in the aftermath of that horrific po po port blast last week. We get the latest. That's coming up next. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. Lebanon's government is about to resign. The public is demanding their resignation after that terrible port blast in Beirut that killed more than 150 people, injured thousands, and displaced hundreds of thousands more. Joining us now from Beirut's Bloom Bloomberg Bureau is Lynn Nwayed. So, Lynn, thank you so much for being with us. Give us a sense, first of all, politically, what's going on with the government there? So um, the government's been under pressure since the blast because everyone blamed it on years of negligence and corruption, 2,750 tons of ammonium nitrate, a highly explosive material, was just left at the port for six years until the inevitable happened. Um, so the public has put the blame squarely on government incompetence and um, on... A, nepotistic, corrupt kind of system that, that, that got us in this place. Um, so there were big protests on Saturday 
the Prime Minister promised early elections in an effort to defuse the anger, but that didn't work. Um, other politicians don't want early elections, and you know, uh, an increasing number of ministers within his government started saying that the decent thing to do was to resign, and um, they've ended up resigning. So um, he's expected to go up to the presidential palace in Baghdad and um, and present that formally shortly. But so what happens next? Uh, does the president ask somebody else to form a government or do you have a new election? What, what comes next? So what happens next is that the current team, um, you know, stays in place in a caretaker capacity um, while um, the different political parties that are in parliament um, uh, negotiate who to appoint as the next prime minister. Um, and that's not necessarily a good thing for Lebanon. So while it might seem that you know, the protesters have have kind of made a gain in this sense. Um, actually, a caretaker government won't be able to conclude bailout talks with the IMF. They won't be able to clinch um, international aid and support that the country needs. Um, and they won't really be able to, um, you know, implement those really important structural and economic reforms that the international community has asked the Lebanese government to perform in order to unlock billions of dollars worth of aid. Um, so in Lebanon, uh, governments, because of the complexity of the political system, governments can take months and months and months to be agreed. And oh. that's, um, you yeah. know, that, that could be what we're looking at. Yeah, in the meantime, there's a catastrophe to deal with. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. That's Bloomberg's Lynn Nwayed. Coming up, Balance of Power continues on Bloomberg Radio. In our second hour, we're going to talk with Professor Matt Dalek. He's a professor at George Washington University's Graduate School of Political Management about whether these uh, executive orders out of President Trump are lawful. Are they consistent with the U.S. Constitution? That's coming up. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television.